In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, welcome back to our weekly readings of the works of the Holy Fathers. Today we will be beginning a new book. We will be reading the life of the Holy Prophet Moses by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Let us pray and we will begin. O heavenly King, comfort a spirit of truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. <clears throat> so, some time ago, I asked the viewers on the channel what book they would like to see us read next and there was a request for the life of saint moses by saint gregory of nyssa so book one <clears throat> prologue the life of Moses or concerning perfection in virtue. Chapter 1. At horse races, the spectators, intent on victory, shout to their favorites in the contest, even though their horses are eager to run. From the stands, they participate in the race with their eyes, thinking to incite the charioteer to keener effort, at the same time urging the horses on while leaning forward and flailing the air with their outstretched hands instead of a whip. They do this not because their actions themselves contribute anything to the victory, but in this way, by their goodwill, they eagerly show in voice and deed their concern for the contestants. I seem to be doing the same thing myself, most valued friend and brother. While you are competing admirably in the divine race along the course of virtue, light-footedly leaping and straining, constantly for the prize of the heavenly calling i exhort urge and encourage you vigorously to increase your speed i do this not moved to it by some unconsidered impulse but to humor the delights of a beloved child Two, since the letter which you recently sent requested us to furnish you with some counsel concerning the perfect life i thought it only proper to answer your request although there may be Nothing useful for you in my words. Perhaps this example of ready obedience will not be wholly unprofitable to you. For if we who have been appointed to the position of fathers over so many souls considered proper here in our old age to accept a commission from youth, how much more suitable is it, inasmuch as we have taught you, a young man, to obey voluntarily, that the right action of ready obedience be confirmed in you? <clears throat> Three, so much for that. We must take up the task that lies before us, taking God as our guide in our treaties. You requested, dear friend, that we trace in outline for you what the perfect life is. Your intention clearly was to translate the grace disclosed by my word into your own life, if you should find in my treaties what you were seeking. I am at an equal loss about both things. It is beyond my power to encompass perfection in my treaties, or to show in my life the insights of the treaties. And perhaps I am not alone in this. Many great men, even those who excel in virtue, will admit that for such, for them such an accomplishment as this is unattainable. For, as I would not seem, in the words of the psalmist there, to tremble for fear where, where no fear was, I shall set forth for you more clearly what I think. 5. The perfection of everything which can be measured by the senses is marked off by certain definite boundaries. Quantity, for example, admits of both continuity and limitation, for every quantitative measure is circumscribed by certain limits proper to itself. The person who looks at a cubit or at the number 10 knows that its perfection consists in the fact that it has both a beginning and an end. But in the case of virtue, we have learned from the Apostle that its one virtue never ceased straining toward those things that are still to come. I'm most positive that he's referring here to the Holy Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Coming to a stop in the race was not safe for him. Why? Because no good has a limit in its own nature, but is limited by the presence of its opposite, as life is limited by death and light by darkness. 
And every good thing generally ends with all those things which are perceived to, to be the contrary to the good. 6. Just as the end of life is the beginning of death, so also stopping the race of virtue marks the beginning of the race of evil. Thus, our statement that grasping perfection with reference to virtue is impossible was not false, for it has been pointed out that what is marked off by boundaries is not virtue. I said that it is also impossible for those who pursue the life of virtue to attain perfection. The meaning of this statement will be examined. Now, if we were to pause here for a moment, here for a moment, However, he does say something that's very important, and that is, he says that um, <clears throat> he says that stopping the life of virtue marks the end of its perfection, which basically means once you stop the life of virtue, you begin the life of sin, and I think that very clearly reminds us of an. Yes, I think we're much better now. I do apologize for the technical hiccup. <clears throat> Thus, what I think St. Gregory here is saying in a very interesting way is that the moment we stop striving for virtue, we start sort of falling into sin. Now, if I were asked to give an example from life, perhaps I would say, Imagine something that's either floating on the water or, better yet, a plane that flies but cannot glide through the air on its own, which is not a glider. Such a plane has to be propelled at all times. Basically, its engine has to be working on a regular basis because the moment it stops working, it will start losing altitude. Best case scenario is a lot of planes, of course, are built in such a way that they can at least glide part of the way. But some uh, flying machines, I guess, are built in such a way that if their engines stop, they just tumble to the ground. And I think that in some way, perhaps, depending on the state of our souls and uh, sort of the place in our progression, on the path of life of virtue if we stop exercising in virtue well maybe we glide a little bit but then we definitely must pick up so in some cases a spiritual life is not a direct line uh, from earth to heaven but it might be a bit of a zigzag and in some cases of, of course when we stumble and we fall we falter so to speak then we have to get up and and pick up our pace but in this case, I think it's quite interesting that very early on, St. Gregory, speaking of the life of virtue, basically says that the moment you stop striving for virtue, the opposite begins. Seven, the divine one is himself the good. So in this particular case, it's all capitalized, the divine one and the good. In the primary and proper sense of the word, whose very nature is goodness. This is he, and he is so named, and is known by this nature. Since then, it has not been demonstrated that there is any limit to virtue except evil. And since the divine does not admit of an opposite, we hold the divine nature to be unlimited and infinite. Certainly, whoever pursues true virtue participates in nothing other than God, because he is himself absolute virtue. Since then, those who know what is good by, by nature desire participation in it. And since this good has no limit, the participant's desire itself necessarily has no stopping place, but stretches out with the limitless. 8. It is therefore undoubtedly impossible to attain perfection, since, as I have said, perfection is not marked off by limits. The one limit of virtue is the absence of a limit. How, then, would one arrive at the sought-for boundary when he can find no boundary? 9. Although on the whole my argument has shown that what is sought for us is unattainable, one should not disregard the commandment of the Lord, which says, Therefore be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. For in the case of those things which are good by nature, even if men of understanding were not able to attain to everything, 
by attaining even a part, they could yet gain a great deal. 10. We should show great diligence not to fall away from the perfection with, which is attainable, but to acquire as much as possible to me to make use of Scripture as a counselor in this matter. For the divine voice says somewhere in the prophecy of Isaiah, Consider Abraham your father and Sarah who gave you birth. Scripture gives this admonition to those who wander outside virtue, just as at sea those who are carried away from the direction of the harbor bring themselves back on course by a clear sign upon seeing either a beacon light raised up on high or some mountain peak coming into view. In the same way, the scripture, by the example of Abraham and Sarah, may guide us again to the harbor of the divine will, those adrift on the sea of life with a pilotless mind. 12. Human nature is divided into male and female, and the free choice of virtue or of evil is said before both equally. For this reason, the corresponding example of virtue for each sex has been exemplified by the divine voice, so that each by observing the one to which he is akin, the men to Abraham and the women to Sarah, <clears throat> may be directed in the life of virtue by the appropriate examples. 13. Perhaps, then, the memory of anyone distinguished in life would be enough to fill our need for a beacon of light and to show us how we can bring our soul to the sheltered harbor of virtue, where it is no longer where it no longer has to pass the winter amid the storms of life or be shipwrecked in the deep water of evil by the successive billows of passion. It may be for this very reason that the daily life of those sublime individuals is recorded in detail that by imitating those earlier examples of right action, those who follow them may conduct their lives to the good. So now he's talking about Abraham and Sarah, and I imagine he will then proceed to Moses quite uh, quickly soon, <clears throat> uh, soon after. Speaking, though, of the limitless perfection, if I may, I would like to give you an example, one that I like very much, of two elders, and I think it's Abba Joseph and Abba Lot, and I can't remember which one came to which, Abba Lot to Abba Joseph or Abba Joseph to Abba Lot. But one of them comes to the other and says, Father, you know, I pray a little. And most likely he was praying all the time. I fast a little, which means, you know, he was eating very little. You know, I give alms. I do, you know, I do some psalms. What else can I do? And the other father looks at him and he says, if you wish, you can become all fire. And he raises his hands up in the air and lights come out of his fingers and stretch all the way up toward heaven. Lights like the light of Mount Tabor. So we see that the Desert Fathers also realized that there is no end to perfection. And even though they were not sort of as classically educated and theologically astute as St. Gregory of Nyssa, they still had the same spirit and, of course, the same virtue. <clears throat> 14. What then? Someone will say, how shall I imitate them, since I am not a Chaldean, as I remember Abraham was, nor was I nourished by the daughter of the Egyptian, as Scripture teaches about Moses. And in general, I do not have in these matters anything in my life corresponding to any one of the ancients. How shall I place myself in the same rank with one of them, when I do not know how to imitate anyone so far removed from me by the circumstances of this life. To him we reply that we do not consider being a Chaldean a virtue or a vice, nor is anyone exiled from the life of virtue by living in Egypt or spending his life in Babylon, nor, again, has God been known to the esteemed individuals in Judea only, nor in Zion, as people commonly think, the divine habitation. We need some subtlety of understanding, the keenness of vision, to discern from the history how, by removing ourselves from such Chaldeans and Egyptians, and by escaping from such a Babylonian captivity, we shall embark on the blessed life. 15. Let us put forth Moses as our example for life in our treatise. First, we shall go through and outline his life as we have learned it from the divine scriptures. Then we shall seek out the spiritual understanding which corresponds to the history in order to obtain suggestions of virtue. Through such understanding, we may come to know the perfect life of men. Now, I think I am quite grateful to the individual who requested that we read this book. 
already for one reason that St. Gregory should say, well, how shall I imitate the saints? Because I'm not a Chaldean, you know, I didn't grow up in Pharaoh's palace in, in uh, Egypt or, you know, and so on. This seems like a perfect parallel for those among us who today say, well, why should I bother reading the lives of the ancient saints from the times of persecutions or from, you know, the times of the peace in the church or ecumenical councils or later times, even as, you know, maybe 100, 200 years ago. They, how does that relate to me? It's quite easy to hear someone say that. And hopefully St. Gregory will give us a beautiful idea of how we should not strive to imitate the saints in the literal sense, but we should definitely imitate their virtues. History of Moses, 16. Moses is said to have been born when the tyrant's law sought to prevent the birth of male offspring. Yet in his outward grace, he anticipated the whole contribution which he would make in time. Already appearing beautiful in swaddling clothes, he caused his parents to draw back from having such a child destroyed by death. Now, in this particular case, St. Gregory is referring to the fact that Pharaoh, who's afraid that the Israelites would outnumber the Egyptians and would take over their country, issued a decree that all the male children would be put to death upon birth. And Moses, when he was born as an infant, was so beautiful that his parents felt something special. Now, okay, any parent, sees his child. I would say perhaps maybe 99% of the parents see their child regardless. I saw that he was beautiful, perhaps maybe in some way. 17. Thus, when the threat of the tyrant prevailed, he was not simply thrown into the Nile, but was placed in a basket, daubed along its joints with slime and pitch, and so was given to the current. This was recounted by those who carefully gave a narrative concerning him. So basically it says that he wasn't just drowned in the river, but he was put in the basket, which was sealed from water leaking into it so that he would not drown. Guided by some divine power, the basket moved to a certain place along the sloping bank where it was washed up naturally by the lapping of the waves. As the king's daughter happened to come to that grassy bank where the basket washed up, she discovered him when he gave a childlike cry in the ark. When she saw the outward grace evident in him, the princess, out of her goodwill, immediately adopted him and took him as her son. But when he instinctively refused a stranger's nourishment, he was nursed at his mother's breast through the contriv contrivance of his close relatives. We know from the book of Genesis, unless this is already in Exodus, do forgive me, but basically we know from the Holy Scriptures that... Let's see, uh, the sister of Moses went along the shore and she essentially said to the Pharaoh's daughter, if you'd like, I can find you a nurse for this child. 18. After he had left childhood and had been educated in pagan learning during his royal upbringing, he did not choose the, uh, the things considered glorious by the pagans, nor did he any longer recognize as his mother the wise... Then, when two Hebrews fought with each other, he tried to restrain them, counseling them that because they were brothers, they should make nature and not passion the arbiter of their disputes. <clears throat> 19. Having been rebuffed by one in the wrong, he made this rejection the occasion for a greater philosophy. Separating himself from association with the people, he thereafter lived alone. He became the son-in-law of one of the foreigners, a man with insight into what is noble and perceptive in judging the habits and lives of men. This man saw in one act the attack on the shepherds, the virtue of the young man, how he fought on behalf of the right without looking for personal gain. Considering the right valuable in itself, Moses punished the wrong done by the shepherds, although they had done nothing against him. Honoring the young man, Moses, for these acts and judging his virtue in his manifest poverty, more valuable than great riches, the man gave him his daughter in marriage, and in keeping with his authority, he permitted Moses to live as he wished. Moses lived alone in the mountains, away from all the turmoil of the marketplace. There in the wilderness, he cared for his sheep. 
Now, here, St. Gregory refers to the event that happened. Well, prior to that, I suppose I should say, St. Gregory describes in as much detail as does the Holy Scripture that when Moses defended a Hebrew against an Egyptian, he killed the Egyptian when he tried to intervene because he considered that maybe he could help his people being the adopted king of the Pharaoh, I mean, the adopted son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He thought that he could help his people. However, his people rejected him. Now, personally, recently reading the Old Testament, I was wondering about the fact that there's a parallel. The Lord came to save his pe people from their sins and a large portion of those people rejected him and a significant portion, the portion that actually managed to have him crucified. Now, Moses was not killed the way the Lord was. However, Moses was rejected by his people. One of them said, are you going to kill me just like you killed the Egyptian? And when Moses realized that this murder was now common knowledge, he fled. He fled to Madiam, uh, sort of a nearby place in the desert. And there he defended Jethro's daughters who were mistreated by the shepherds who came to the well where Jethro's daughters, his father and future father-in-law's daughters, were also sort of watering, you know, getting water for their animals. And that is why St. Gregory says, Jethro, the father of these young women, realized that Moses stood up for what was right because the shepherds offended the young women. He defended them, and Jethro gave him his daughter as his wife. 20. After he had passed some time in this kind of life, the history says an awe-inspiring theophany occurred. At high noon, a light brighter than the sunlight dazzled his eyes. Astonished at the strange sight, he looked up at the mountain and saw a bush from which this light was flaming up like a fire. Now, we should do uh, St. Moses justice and say that he lived in Egypt for 40 years. Then he fled for Madiam, and he lived there for 40 years. And at the age of 80, he had this theophany, <clears throat> or right about 80. When he saw the branches of the bush sprouting up in flame as if they were in pure water, he said to himself, I will go and see this great sight. As soon as he said this, he no longer received the marvel of the light with his sight alone, but, which is most astounding of all, his hearing too was illuminated by the rays of light. The light's grace was distributed to both senses, illuminating the sight with flashing rays and lightning, lighting the way for the hearing with undefiled teachings. The voice from the light forbade Moses to approach the mountain burdened with lifeless sandals. He removed the sandals from his feet and so stood on that ground on which the divine light was shining. God spoke to Moses from the bush and told him to remove his sandals because the ground upon which he was standing was holy. 21. I think that the discussion should not dwell extensively on the bare history of the man. We should give attention to the matters we have proposed. After he was empowered by the theophany which he had seen, now, the Greek word theophany means the manifestation of God. <clears throat> we should give atten attention to the matters we have proposed. After he was in okay, he was commanded to release his countrymen from Egyptian bondage. In order that he might learn more fully the strength implanted in him by God, he tested the divine command by the things in his hand. This was the test. When the rod fell from his hand, it became alive, a living creature. In fact, it was a serpent. When he took it up again in his hand, it became what it had been before, becoming an animal. So, basically, God told him to throw his rod on the ground. It turned into a serpent, and when he picked the serpent up by the tail, it once again it became his rod. <clears throat> when he withdrew his hand from his bosom, it looked as white as snow, but when he put it back in, into his bosom, it returned to its natural color, there, uh, so if I can do this with my cassock, imagine Moses putting his hand in his garments, drawing it out, and it was covered with leprosy. It was completely white with leprosy. Then he put it back, 
and uh, it was perfectly normal again. So those were the two signs which God gave him in order to show to the Israelite people in Egypt. 22. Moses went down to Egypt, and he took with him his foreign wife and the children she had borne him. Scripture says that an angel encountered him and threatened death. His wife appeased the angel by the blood of the child's circumcision. Then he met Aaron, who had himself been brought by God to this meeting. Because God told Moses that Aaron would be his spokesperson. Because Moses basically said, well, and this is something that's, I think, already we should consider and draw something of an example from Moses, in that Moses was exceedingly humble, despite the fact that he was raised in Pharaoh's temple. Now imagine the magnitude of the knowledge of the ancient Egyptian civilization. On the one hand, because of the prejudice of the evolutionary thinking uh, affecting modern day society, we tend to think that ancient people were uh, sort of very simple. They worshiped the sun because they were silly. You know, they didn't know, they didn't understand. However, we know uh, from scientists, for example, that they managed to build a temple in the side of the mountain where one time, one time in the entire year, I don't remember if it was the rising or the setting sun, basically penetrated all the way into the, the, the building in the temple and illuminated uh, sort of the far wall, which was otherwise for 365 uh, remaining days of the year, which was always in the shadow. So Moses, surely if he did not possess all that knowledge, he was certainly very well acquainted with it because I can't fathom that he would be raised as an adopted son to the Pharaoh's family and be left ignorant. Surely he knew quite a good bit. And one can imagine that he would have probably said, oh, perfect, of course, God, sure, you know, I'll go and I'll set them free. I'm just the man for the job because I know everything about them. But he says, why send me? I stutter, I can't speak. So he's trying to bow out and yet God tells him no and I will let Aaron speak on your behalf. So that is why Aaron uh, came to his meeting. 23. Later, the people in Egypt were gathered by Moses and Aaron into a general assembly, and their release from bondage was announced all around to those who were already distressed by the hardships of their labors. Now, we know from the scripture also, it says that because of their sufferings, they were praying urgently, and they were begging for God to send them a savior. Report of this came to the tyrant himself, so to the Pharaoh, when he heard it, his anger at both the overseers of the work and the Israelites themselves was greater than ever. The levy of bricks to be made was increased and a harsher command was sent down, not only to those slaving with the clay, but also to those lab uh, laboriously gathering chaff and straw. So basically, Pharaoh... Uh, okay, I won't comment because St. Gregory comments. 24. Pharaoh, for this was the Egyptian tyrant's name, attempted, or title, we should say, attempted to counter the divine signs performed by Moses and Aaron with magical tricks performed by sorcerers. Uh, Jani and Jambri, or Yanni and Yambri, it, it depends on the translation. When Moses again turned his own rod into an animal before the eyes of the Egyptians, they thought that the sorcery of the magicians could equally work miracles with their rods. This deceit was exposed when the serpent produced from the staff of Moses ate the sticks of sorcery, the snakes no less. The rods of the sorcerers had no means of defense, not nor any power of life, only the appearance which cleverly devised sorcery showed to the eyes of those easily deceived. So, here, St. Gregory moved forward rather quickly, and because of that, if you will allow me, I will uh, make a, a small comment about the fact that by increasing the levy of bricks and forcing the Israelites themselves to collect the straw for the bricks, because I guess they had assistance with that, he told them that from now on they're going to have to do that themselves, he was hoping to turn the Israelites against Moses and Aaron because as their lives were 
becoming worse in quality because they had to work even more. He was hoping they would basically tell Moses, you know what, leave us alone. We don't want you to uh, deliver us from this slavery. And then when Moses threw his rod in front of the Pharaoh and it turned into a snake, it turned into a serpent, these two magicians did the same. However, Moses' rod swallowed theirs. So his serpent swallowed theirs. Now, from the perspective of the ancients, the rod was also the symbol of power. And in this, we clearly see that God's power given to Moses, because it was God who told him to do that with his rod, was far greater than the Egyptian sorcerers. Hence, the rod of Moses swallowed theirs. 25. When Moses saw that all the subjects agreed with their leader in his evil, he laid a blow upon the whole Egyptian nation, sparing no one from the calamities. Like an army under orders, the very elements of the universe, earth, water, air, and fire, which are seen to be in everything, cooperated with him in, in this attack on the Egyptians and changed their natural operations to serve human purposes. For by the same power and at the same time and place, the disorderly were punished and those free of wrong did not suffer. So, 26. At the command of Moses, all the water in Egypt turned into blood. The fish were destroyed because the water thickened. But to, he, to the Hebrews alone, the blood was water when they drew it. Found among the Hebrews, this water provided an occasion for the magicians to use their art in the making the water appear bloody. Similarly, frogs covered, in Egypt, uh, covered Egypt in large numbers. Their breeding in these numbers was not natural. But Moses' command changed the normal density of frogs. All the land was in a sorry state, for the Egyptians' houses were being overrun with these creatures, while the Hebrews were free from this hateful plague. So he's already talking about the second plague here, because the first one was that Moses turned all the water into uh, blood for the Egyptians. However, when the Hebrews drew this water, it was a water for them. Now, quite interestingly, when recently I was rereading this portion of the Old Testament, I paid attention and was rather surprised that it was not Moses who put the rod in the water, but it was Aaron, because God commanded Aaron to be a spokesperson. 28. Likewise, there was no distinction between night and day to the Egyptians who lived in an unchanging gloom. To the Hebrews, however, nothing was out of the ordinary. It was the same with all the other things, the hail, the fire, the boils, the gadflies, the flies, the cloud of locusts. Each had its natural effect on the Egyptians. The Hebrews learned of the misfortune of their neighbors by report, since they experienced no similar attack on themselves. So all the punishments that God was sending on the Egyptians to force them to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, these punishments did not affect the Israelites. Then the death of the firstborn made the distinction between Egyptians and Hebrews still sharper. The Egyptians were dismayed, lamenting the loss of their dearest children, while the Hebrews continued to live in total serenity and safety. Salvation was assured to them by the shedding of the blood. At every entrance, both the doorposts and the lintel join, joining them were marked with blood. So they had to celebrate the very first Passover. And the Passover lamb was sacrificed by the Israelites. And this lamb's blood was put on the doorposts and on the lintel. So you could almost draw the figure of the cross through uh, this blood on the doors. 29. While the Egyptians were downcast at the fate of their firstborn, and each individual was lamenting his sufferings and those of everyone else, Moses led the exodus, exodus of the Israelites. He had previously prepared them to take away with themselves the wealth of the Egyptians on the pretext that it was a loan. The history goes on to say that when they were three days out of Egypt, the Egyptian was angry that Israel did not remain in slavery. And after mobilizing all his subjects for war, he pursued the people with his cavalry. When they saw the deployment of the cavalry and infantry, they were panic-stricken since they were inexperienced in war and untrained in such sights. And they rose up against Moses. Then the history tells the most marvelous thing about Moses. He did two distinctly separate things at once. By spoken word, 
he encouraged the Israelites and exhorted them not to abandon high hopes, but inwardly in his thoughts he pleaded with God on behalf of those who cowered in fear, and he was directed by counsel from above how to escape the danger. God himself, the history says, gave ear to his voiceless cry. So in this particular case, St. Gregory says that as Moses was talking to the people, he was at the same time directing his prayer to God. I, I personally think that's a very interesting idea that he brings to our attention here. 30. By divine power, a cloud led the people. This was no ordinary cloud, for it was not composed of the vapors or exhalations as normal clouds are. The winds did not press the vapors of the air into a misty composition. It was something beyond human comprehension. Scripture testifies that there was something amazing about that cloud. When the rays of the noonday sun shone with great heat, the cloud was a shelter for the people, shadowing those below it and moistening with a light due the fiery heat of the atmosphere. During the night, it became a fire, leading the Israelites as in procession with its own light from sunset to sunrise. So, indeed, that was quite a great miracle for them in the desert. 31. Moses himself watched the cloud, and he taught the people to keep, in, uh, keep it in sight. When the cloud had guided them along their course, they came to the Red Sea, where the Egyptians, coming from behind with their whole army, surrounded the people. No way of escape from the terrors was open to the Israelites in any direction, because they were trapped between their enemies and the water. It was then that Moses, urged, by, urged on by divine power, performed the most incredible deed of all. He approached the bank and struck the sea with his rod. The sea split at the blow, just as a crack in the glass runs, straight across to the edge when a break occurs at any point. The whole sea was split like that from the top by the rod, and the break in the waters reached to the opposite bank. At the place where the sea parted, Moses went down into the deep with all the people, and they were in the deep without getting wet, and their bodies were still in the sunlight. As they crossed the depths by foot on dry bottom, they were not alarmed at the water piled up so close to them on both sides, for the sea had been fixed like a wall on each side of them. Now, this also is a great miracle, and in some way, perhaps since St. Gregory isn't making this parallel, we could do it ourselves. Oftentimes in our lives, we are led by God into a situation where we are surrounded by the enemy, sort of against the bank of the Red Sea, you might say, completely, because Pharaoh cut them off, cut all the escape for the Israelites. We are surrounded, and we are up against a wall. We are up against the sea or some other seemingly impenetrable barrier of escape. And yet, by the power of the cross, we are always capable of finding our salvation from the tribulation that follows us, as the Israelites did. And of course, a great miracle for them was the fact that as the sea parted, the bottom of the sea was dry. So when the Israelites crossed in great numbers, there were hundreds of thousands of people who crossed. They had the light and they also were walking on dry ground so they did not get stuck. 32. When Pharaoh and the Egyptians ran after them headlong into the sea, along the newly cut path, the walls of water came together again, and the sea rushed in upon itself to assume its previous form, becoming to the eye a single body of water. By that time, the Israelites were already resting on the opposite bank from the long and strenuous march through the sea. Then they sang a, song, a victory song to God for raising a monument unstained with blood on their behalf, since he destroyed in the water the whole army of the Egyptians, their horses, infantry, and chariots. 33. After that, Moses pushed on, but when he had traveled three days without water, he was at a loss how to relieve the thirst of the army. They pitched camp near a pool of salty water, more bitter than the sea itself. While they were resting close to the water and were parched with thirst, Moses, acting on the counsel of God, found a piece of wood near the place and threw it into the water. Immediately it became drinkable, for the wood of its own power changed the nature of the water from bitter to sweet. 
Now, of course, all the Holy Fathers commenting on this particular passage uh, in the life of St. Moses, the Holy Prophet Moses, and the entire nation of Israel say again that this wood that turned water from bitter into sweet also is the image of the cross of Christ, which has the power to turn the bitter sufferings and temptations that we come upon in our lives into sweet. 33. As the cloud moved forward, the Israelites followed their guide closely. They always rested from their march wherever the cloud indicated by stopping, and they departed again whenever the cloud led the way on. By following this guide, they arrived at a place irrigated with drinkable water. It was watered all around by twelve bountiful springs and shaded by a grove of date palms. There were seventy date palms, <clears throat> which, even though few in number, made a great impression on those who saw them because of their exceptional beauty and height. 35. Again, their guide, the cloud, rose up and led them forth to another place. But this was a desert with arid, scorching sand and not a drop of water to moisten the country. Here once more thirst exhausted the people, but when Moses struck a prominent rock with his rod, it gave forth water, which was sweet and drinkable in great abundance, in greater abundance than was needed by even so large a host. I think that if you will uh, bear with me and forgive me, I will make this our stopping point for tonight. We will hopefully continue not the following week because the following week is Holy Week and of course there will be daily services morning and evening and I will be quite busy, understandably quite busy, but hopefully we will be able to continue during Bright Week. And by God's grace, we will read on this beautiful life of St. Moses, I imagine that, uh, just as St. Gregory says, at first he will recount the entire life of St. Moses and then he will draw some interesting parallels. But even as we are recounting it, of course we should not fail to see the multiple lessons that it offers us on the ability and the power of God to save us in all of our temptations and tribulations. So let us pray and we will stop for the night. <clears throat> it is truly me to bless thee that thou art O Cos, ever blessed and most blameless and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave his birth to God the Word, the very Theotokos of thee do we magnify. God bless all of you. Thank you for your prayers, for your support. Always feel free to leave a comment here or in the comments or ask a question. I will do my best to respond. Also, I wish all of you the most profitable remainder of Great Lent. I hope that you have a peaceful and holy, holy week. And of course, a bright and joyous celebration of Pascha. God bless.